Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. It's doing, day. Josie. I Hello. like it. you get musical. musical. I like those <laughs> umbrellas of Sherborg moments that we get every now and again. Still, one of my favourite things ever was. Uh, by the way, welcome to uh, Shamble Stay at Home Festival. But the, that that festival that was done by the same people who did End of the Road, where oh, you no took direction over, home. No Direction Home, be- beautiful. Dirty Three were playing, who were magnificent. And you ended up doing a kind of just almost solipsistic karaoke for about five hours, didn't you? It was because John Robbins, who is somebody who is much better able to handle drink than me, started drinking with me at about midday. And then because it was a new festival, they'd booked comedy till about 2 p.m., then comedy from about 11 p.m. with just a nine hour break with all of this functioning equipment so we were like we'll put on a disco for everyone but it just became me blind drunk just singing along to an ipod it was beautiful it was, it was for me some, some of the greatest wanna dies covers that i've ever heard <laughs> Put it up with the fact that Pink Floyd on uh, the day of the moon landing mm, just did a mm. jam, right? They literally they just they did they did a jam that's never been released. This kind of blues jam to accompany uh, the, the the lunar module landing, and there's no proper recording of that. And equally, I feel much the same about your nine hours of Wanna Die's covers. And honestly, thank God, Darby. thank God it was pre you know social media. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I don't. I, I haven't yet thought what my um, show and tell, tell item is. Don't worry, I'll do my show and tell, and I'll just t- tell you who's, who's coming up. up. Uh, we have Phil Jays, who is a, a wonderful singer songwriter. Mm-hmm. If you've uh, been to uh, some of the Christmas shows that we've done over the last kind of 10, 15 years, uh, or quite often actually, he's been on tour with me as well. Really uh, wonderful uh, singer. Uh, very often of doom laden um, songs as well. So that that's uh, that's a delight. Um, and also we have um, Celia with us as well some of you will know celia from last week um my show and tell is uh, it's fun isn't it when it gets to like week four working out what we've got left in the house to still show and tell yes <laughs> i was like i don't have this many items oh, oh, I, I want to say really early on uh, in this that we do have um a tip jar if you do enjoy the shows if you want to go back and watch all the shows that we've done uh, there's a way you'll be able to see that you can donate to us um anything helps if that we would love that um but also what we are planning to do and what we're already doing is we're distributing the money amongst artists that need it and also we are distributing money to venues that were already kind of struggling for funding and already uh kind of clinging on uh, to help their communities and which will really be struggling even more because of um the fact that they can't operate also i heard such a scary thing today on the radio where the streets mike skinner was like america's saying that the next time people can go to concerts is autumn 2021 and i was like <laughs> we might be all right do you know what this might be the time where those of us with a niche market can shine <laughs> well, they say, the, the, i'm afraid we can't have any more, any more than 173 uh, yes, and only, only 17 in lincoln lincoln has different rules brilliant that's as many as i sell in lincoln i'm off on tour yes uh, i'm just gonna go to lots of places where my politics is deeply unpopular everywhere <laughs> and then i can go <laughs> and then i can do a big tour um my, my my no don't be talking about my, my show and tells I, I backstage quite often doing gigs is someone just goes someone left this for you and, and very often there's kind of you know various arcane books and other things like that and this i like this was when i was touring with brian cox last year uh and uh someone left this for me i, th- I can't remember which which city it was in but they'd made Trodinger strawberry <laughs> now um for those of you who don't know it's an odd thing the show that i do the infinite monkey cage with brian cox about series seven there was a moment where someone was explaining an experiment and they said so basically what you needed to do is you get a you know a dead strawberry and brian then suddenly looked all kind of ethereal he went when is a strawberry dead and this then became for some reason even though actually you you can very quickly find out what is officially diagnosed as uh, but it didn't matter somehow it's still dragged out for about 10 years it's the poetry of it well, it was. It was an interesting, but you know, the whole different idea about you know his jam in itself, some kind of Schrodinger's you know presentation of strawberries, and uh, and so someone had just made a Schrodinger strawberry, and there it is in the box. Uh, at that point, the strawberry is both dead and alive, and uh, now there we are. 
there is the strawberry and there's oh, I think wow. it's alive i think i think i've i've uh, got it in a, in a i've revealed now in uh, the superposition has collapsed and now it's a live strawberry so that was just a lovely i like it you know, that kind of make and do thing so is it a superposition that was lovely yeah <laughs> brian bless you. so much fun um i the, can show you this this is a foam roller that I have because of starting to jog again. My daughter has treats it like it's a beloved soft toy and carries it around and calls it Roly and gives it cuddles and kisses. Roly. That's because you you said you didn't want to buy any um, toys. Didn't she has you? no toys. Yeah, to toys are a symbol of the patriarchy. She can have my Roly. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, we're, jo we're joined today by. Uh, well, um, I think. I don't think he had finished his tour, Trolls. Um, uh, a man I've, I've just introduced you, David Baddiel. How are you, uh, I'm all right, Robbie. I've got hay fever, which sounds like a terribly stupid, rubbish thing to complain about at a time of national pandemic. Uh, but it actually is a real pain in the arse. Uh, not least because it's one of the things you get. People have probably got quite a lot of them where you think like, oh, no, is this it? Have I got COVID-19? No, I'm just fucking sneezing like I always do at this time of year. Uh, but apart from that, I'm well. I didn't finish my tour. No, I had to stop my tour slap bang in the middle of it, actually. Cheltenham was my last date. It was quite emotional, actually. I wonder if that was the same for other comedians, mm -hmm. knowing that they were having to stop the tour and not knowing when they might restart. I just heard Josie say the words autumn 2021, uh, which is interesting because all of my dates have been rescheduled for exactly a year before that. All my dates have been rescheduled for... October and November, but I yeah, have too. to say, I always get the line from uh, You'll Never walk, walk Alone, which is with hope in our hearts, is what I always think, because I'm not at all sure that anyone's going to be going to gigs in uh, or in the autumn. But yeah, uh, I had quite an emotional gig on a Sunday night sometime in March in Cheltenham. I came on and I said, it's great. I mean, even then I said, it's great to see that you prepared to congregate in such large numbers at this stage in the apocalypse. And I got quite a big laugh, but not as big a laugh as a man in the audience who coughed deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> so things were going, you know, were going that way at that point. I was lucky because I think the, the last because I think the, the last live event I did, uh, I, I did a show with uh, Jeff Lloyd and Ed Miliband. Uh, they do a podcast called Reasons to Be Cheerful. That's very and, new. Yeah, and it was and what was delightful was Ed Miliband uh, asked me to explain black holes, so I started to explain them to him, and it just it had you know that prop moment where someone's mind gets properly blown, and mm -hmm. they just and obviously I I you know explained it in a reasonably cat handed fashion. I'm not a scientist, but nevertheless the idea of density and gravity and the yeah. inability of light to escape and all that, and I'm running through this different idea of new neutron stars and all that kind of, and it, then he just he just looked, he couldn't get rid of this, it, and, and he went, I just didn't, I know, and I didn't, and, and and so the nice thing is, my final gig, I left someone feeling utterly lost in the cosmos. And I thought, <laughs> you know, it was kind of, but it was... It was I saw Ed Miliband the other day, actually, I've got Ed Miliband, which is, I was walking on Hampstead Heath in my in our regular family, feels like a prison routine, kind of hourly, exit, we get an hour or whatever it is of exercise. And I saw Ed Miliband coming towards me, and I, I don't really know him very well, he's not a close friend, but I do know him, and I waved to him. Thing is, I had a mask on. Right, and and he looked at me like, oh, that's just a bloke waving at me because I'm Ed Miliband. And then I was in a quandary because I thought, do I pull the mask down to say, no, no, it's me, David Baddiel? But is that a health risk? And so I just walked past, and he looked confused. But maybe he was still thinking about black holes. The, we were talking about these quandaries. I don't know if you've had this. I don't know if you've had this quandary. I don't know if you've had it, Jason. We I was mentioning the other day when I was doing the slapstick festival, uh, a waiter came up to me as I was leaving and said, "I'm an enormous fan of yours. Can I get a photo?" And I was like, "But well, this is, you know, every now and again in very niche festivals that might happen. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying I have some level of celebrity. You know, but in niche festivals that might happen." I said, "Oh yeah, sure, that's fine." And then he said. Kevin and Perry really got me through my teenage years. So he presumed that I was Harry Enfield. Yeah. Now, oh. so, so that then became a He's quandary. 10 years older than you. I know, I know, but I've not looked after myself. We know that. Chris. <laughs> we know. You, have, you exercise um, every but, day. But it's that, those quandaries of mistaken identity or do I, should I continue to explain who I am? Josie, you've had Oh, one. I get people telling me I've been on shows I've not been on. And I'm like, oh, that wasn't me. And they're like, yes, it was. And then I feel like, yeah, do I go along with it? Like sometimes I'll be like, oh, yes, yes, when I was yeah. on Mock the Week, yes. Uh, like, I, I don't know who they think I am. A thousand of these very specific people that I look like. I have talked about this many times before, but 
a, a few favourites. My Ronan Keating of boys and came out to be at the com- not. Uh, no, I thought I looked like him. Uh, Ronan <laughs> Keating <laughs> That's what I was came out to like, me at the Comedy Awards once and honestly praised me maybe for ten minutes. Just a wild litany of praise. And at the end of it, he said, "And the thing I really loved was Blackadder." And I said, "Yeah, I'm not Ben Elton." And he just looked really pissed off, like I was deliberately trying to trick him with my face. <laughs> And honestly, I mean, just constantly, it's constantly Ben Elton. So I, I, I'm not going to do it now, but I used to do 10 minutes for Android Webber thinking I was Ben Elton. Uh, the genuine showbiz belief that he wrote The Beautiful Game, his musical about football, because someone said to him, oh, look, you should get that Jewish bloke off the telly with glasses and a beard who knows about football. And they mistakenly got Ben Elton, who, by the way, knows nothing about football. Uh, so it is a strange thing. Uh, but I've honestly been convinced that he still is not entirely sure whether I'm not Ben Elton. I, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I did meet him at a showbiz event and said to him, you know, I'm not Ben Elton. And he just looked really, really worried, like, oh, my God, what's wrong with Ben? He's having a <laughs> breakdown. Um, so, yeah, it's Ben Elton. It's Ian Brody. Uh, the Times once printed a whole article about how I'd created a fracas at a, a Peter Gabriel concert. Uh, and was drunk and had to be removed. And what was really weird about it was I had been at that Peter Gabriel concert, but none of that had happened unless I'd been totally madly drunk, which I hadn't been. And I phoned up the bloke I was with and said, was this me? They said no. And then eventually, and I'm sorry for the name drop, I contacted Peter Gabriel, because I do sort of know him. So do you know anything about this? And he investigated it, and it was Ian Brody, who was at the same gig and had got drunk and disorderly, and who the Times had just got mixed up with. He's doing all that, so you all don't. That, have so you don't have to, and you yeah, can get the bad yeah. boy rep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that does sting, doesn't it? As well, there's a strange, strange thing. thing of someone being effusive. So you've then had that dopamine mm. hit of, mm. isn't it lovely to be loved by this person? And then it's been revealed that they don't even know who you are. <laughs> and that that at that point, and the yes. extension of it, like how far, like, like Harry ends just, just about see with you. I once got given a free meal in Swansea from someone who thought I was the DJ, Steve Wright. <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, I get He wears glasses. He wears glasses. He does wear glasses. And he has got something of a beard, I believe. I still ate the free meal. Do you think if, you've yeah. got, if I got a pair of glasses, I could glasses, just, pretend, I could to just... Be, pretend to be any glasses wearer? Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we can't do that, Josie. Every time we're working together, no one will be able tell the difference so it'd be utterly utterly we'd have impossible. to always stand on one side like Actually, I, 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 I do have someone here who looks like me that i'm going to use for my show who sort of looks like me uh there there he is oh that's my, my spitting image puppet which uh i i discovered that you were it's got an avalon thing on i better remove that because i think they don't actually have representation of him. And uh, <laughs> what do you think of him? I've always, I, I only got him because someone else bought him, right, in the big sell-off. And then he didn't want him anymore <laughs> and said, do you want him? So I, uh, I basically donated a thousand quid to a food bank and that, for that he gave me this. And I've always been a bit uncertain about it because not because I'm very happy to be on a spitting image. But to me, this looks like me if I was drawn by someone who worked for Der Sturmer the Nazi magazine. I, I, so, okay, I have lots of questions about this. About okay, this. Okay. I, I have memories of Spitting Image, but it is mainly sort of the political, you know, like the guy who was the slug and the guy who only at peas. Kenneth Baker. Major, yeah, the, this, and, yeah, and I had no idea. So they also did, was there one, was this of the Mary Whitehouse experience? Yeah, era? About that. yeah they did. They did. TV. As well as politicians. And I was quite a late addition, I think. And all he did basically would say everything was crap. That's oh. what he did. He come used on. to come on. I think it was preying on my early work, which was perhaps a bit negative. And he used to just come on stage and say, yeah, shoes, aren't they crap? And get sort of very small rounds of applause and then walk off again. It yeah, allowed me to say at Wembley Arena, the gig that we did at Wembley Arena, me and Rob Newman, has anyone seen Spitting Image recently? Isn't it crap? Mm. And that got a round of applause, at least. So I got a gag out of it. Yeah, because I remember there was a John Sessions that got eaten by <laughs> got eaten by his own um, anus. Uh, that 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 one of uh, the. But the, do you know what that one does? I'll tell you why I think it does look like the person you were. Is it reminds me of the first time I ever saw you on television? I think it was Filthy Rich and Cat Flap. Would it oh, have been? God. Yeah, yeah. Who so was in that? Well, that, that was Rick Mail, A. A. Demerson, oh, and Nigel Planer. It was, it was the follow-up. 
you're probably too young, aren't you, Joe? For the young ones, uh, which didn't do so well and wasn't as good, but it was still had amazing stuff in it, actually. Yeah. I have seen, no, I've seen bits of it uh, here and there, definitely. Because that was you and your former, that was you and your former double act partner, Black and was it? The, the... No, no, it was just me in it. I've, t- I've got a story about that. How long? How long have we got? Because these. Oh, stories fine. Were... We'll have one of your stories. We'd love to have one of your stories. <laughs> okay. Well, this was a terrible introduction. So uh, I, I had been doing a show in Edinburgh, and they'd seen me there, uh, and they asked me. Who, the, I think it was Ed By, who was the producer of that show, to uh, be in. Actually, they asked me to audition for Red Dwarf. Which was huh. just starting then. Who were uh, they asking you to audition for? Uh, <laughs> because I don't know. It's a good you question. Which part? Oh, oh which part? Uh, yeah. I think the part that Craig Charles. I don't really watch Red Dwarf. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a fantastic show. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Uh, what part is Craig? Is he? Is he the guy who says Smeg? Craig Charles. No, that's the main part. Yeah, that part. Okay. It got, sorry, down sorry, sorry. To, it got down to me and Craig Charles, and Craig Charles got the part. Uh, and anyway, so that was that, and I've been very excited, but I didn't think. It, uh, I just went back to doing stand-up. And then they contacted me again and said, we want you to be in this show, Filthy Rich and Cat Flat, but we just want you to do one show. But it still sounded great because I was going to be a pavement artist who had a big fight with Rick Mail in the show. They did. The second show was about Rick becoming an artist, right? So I thought, brilliant, right? Then they sent me a script saying, we've cut that. We've cut that. Right? Remember, this is me when I'm like 20 and I'm just so excited and my excitement is continually being cut down. Now what you are is someone who, it's a satire about art. Do you remember this uh, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The satire about art, it ends with Eddie, who was Adrian Emerson, farting. Stephen Fry tries to sell his fart to some art people and you're bidding for it. So, okay, it's like not as exciting as it was, but all right. So we're supposed to go and film it in Manchester. I'm still living with my mum and dad, right? So we're supposed to film it in Manchester and there's no internet or anything like that. And they just say a taxi will appear with your plane tickets to Manchester. Get on a plane to Manchester and then you'll film it. I'm still excited because it's Rick Mail, it's Ben Elton, it's Adrian Emerson, it's Fry and Laurie. It's so fantastic. I get up at seven o'clock in the morning. I haven't slept at all. Car doesn't turn up. Taxi just doesn't turn up, right? Mm-hmm. You can't find out where they are or whatever. So eventually, I somehow found out where they were filming. It was a museum in Manchester. I call, I speak to the janitor. The janitor says, just go to Heathrow, get on a plane and come. So I do, with just the, all of, I, I basically get an overdraft. I write a check that I, for money I don't have, 200 quid, to get to Manchester. I'm three hours late for filming. They put me in a room with Rick and Ben and they fucking hate me. You can tell they're thinking we've held up filming of our show for three hours for some twat who's late. And I can't, I try and explain, but they're not interested. I do the filming. And then the last thing I remember is going up to Paul Jackson, who was the producer and director of The Young Ones and of that, and trying to say to him, it, it cost me 200 quid to get here. Is there any chance I can have that money back? And him just ignoring me. And what I will say is he came up to me about three months ago just before the pandemic started, and said, I owe you 200 quid. I'm dead. <laughs> so that, it's incredible that I kept going in showbiz after that. It was a terrible experience. Well, it's a wonderful, well, it's a wonderful performance. I really did believe in the... the uh, I, I thought, that is a man who really would buy a fart at Sotheby's. It was it was tr- tremendously authentic. <laughs> um, I, I went I've to got ask... to seek it out. I bet it's on, it's on YouTube. YouTube. It's yeah, I've, I've, I've got it. I've got it on DVD because I'm very old fashioned like that. Don't worry. Um, yeah. The it's, it's it's the series has got the Nolans in uh, in a uh, a blankety blank parody. It's got uh, it, you're right. It has moments in it, and of course because it's it's Rick Mail basically. He's someone Richie Rich who did links for I think was it TVS. Basically, he briefly was the person who went and now coming up on TVS, and yeah. he that's the only job he's ever had. But he's obsessed with showbiz and thinks he's one of the biggest names it's in a it. Sort of because, early version of Alan Park actually because he's not very successful tv star but with a very very big ego i mean obviously it's got that gigantic broad performance thing that rick had uh to it talking of which by the way i tweeted yesterday and i think it is correct that i don't know if you there's a hilarious moment in the young ones when neil they're on a, pl- a train and neil finds a book uh, that used to be rick's school book and someone's written like, rick is a prick and Rick says, no, actually, I was incredibly popular and everyone thought I was great. <laughs> yeah. And I tweeted yesterday, that was basically President Trump's approach in his press conference yesterday. I'm stunned by, I, I've only had snippets on the news, but I'm the just news? but I'm just stunned that somebody took him to task and he went, well, this is just not true. And, and, and that he's able to do that. Like, no, it's, it's like he, he put together, he got the wild together a short film. 
of people saying he's great, he's doing really well, as if that was an argument. How am I not aware of this yet? Oh, you've got to see it. The wild. film is, is amazing. He just says, okay, I think before we start, let's get the lights down, and I think you should all watch this. And it is literally that. It's Rick in The Young One saying, I am incredibly popular and everyone thinks I'm great. <laughs> and then he thinks, it's as if he thinks that will convince them. But the trouble is, the trouble yeah. is, there are a percentage of, as we've seen, certain extremely inept governments have actually been, got, the, you know, the, the, the public have gone, oh, no, 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 they're doing a really good job. Because if you just tell people like you've done a you're really good job, that you're not referring to our government. Well, no, it's not just this government. It's it's this government. It's going on in Australia. It's going on. It's going on in a lot of the different places where also there seems to be a Murdoch press. But I'm not connecting the two. Yes, that would be conspiracy absolutely. theory. Um, I'm no Eamon Holmes. Um, I see how Eamon um, Holmes. Eamon Holmes. Yeah. Oh, that is. <laughs> so can someone get me up to speed properly um, with what happened? Eamon Holmes said uh, suddenly. Uh, I don't exactly know what they were talking about, but they they had someone on who was being perfectly sensible and saying that the 5G conspiracy, which you may know about, which is that some people think that the introduction of 5G is what caused coronavirus. And this is a really stupid conspiracy theory that has led to 5G masks being burnt and all sorts of things. Someone was on saying, well, obviously it's rubbish and blah, blah, blah. And Eamon Holmes interrupted her and said, well, actually, you know, the mainstream media, anyone who says mainstream media, by the way, instantly dismiss everything they've ever said. But anyway, Eamon said, the mainstream media wants us to believe that. I don't know what's right or not, but I think you should keep an open mind and not follow the state narrative. And I thought, Eamon Holmes, what's going on? Talk about brownies. Talk about what the fuck. Also, like, he could challenge the state narrative that... Boris, you know, has yes, done this glorious, yes. glorious thing as opposed to being completely irresponsible. But instead... Yes, I'm not denying that there is a state narrative. No, 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 I, know, narrative. I, no I really know you're not. But it's just so funny that that's what he's choosing to do, know. you know. I know, but that is... That conspiracy theory looks for the, the wrong narratives in the wrong places. Mm. And you do with anything. You do, you with know, anything I know. You know you become, I know you become a lot more interested again in science and law. But there is that point where you go. Now, this we really need to look at. Now we we need to work out that we need to really. That's a lot of evidence based material. Now this. This is so far, you know, the, the far outness. And very often science will never get to the far because it's yeah. so far out already. It does not require analysis. And it's in the same way when, when I sometimes see people say, you know, it, with David Icke, though, we've got to think about his free speech. Free speech does not mean that you have to provide a platform for the speech, which is why both Josie and I are very rarely on television. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, will, I tell you what, we're going to have a quick break. And then I would like to come back and talk a little bit about um, science, uh, if that's OK. Yes. Uh, you don't. But um, those of you watching last week will have known that we have uh, a, a wonderful guest who uh, kind of flits between the 1940s and 2020 in Eastbourne. And uh, she's returned with us for today. So uh, please welcome with her show and tell and also her stories. Hello and welcome to my uh, show and tell. I'm Celia. Now this is um, A Life in an English Village by Noel Carrington and it has lithographs inside it by Edward Borden. I love Edward Borden terribly. My friend, a very good friend of mine, her mother was taught by Edward Borden at the Royal College of Art a long time ago. So as you can see that beautiful illustration. I bought it for the illustrations. But I must say the actual book itself is brilliant. It's very, very interesting about the history of villages. And I can say with authority after reading the first four pages that all of our problems today stem from the Enclosure Act. Now, reading about the English village reminded me of my own life. And so I thought I'd tell you all about it by reading to you very quickly from my diary. Wednesday. Did a recce of the pantry and was shocked to see that we are low on everything apart from that plum jam that Fred's aunt made and was a bit too tart. Thank heavens there's plenty of celery in the garden. Scurried off down to Best Buy with a tea towel tied around my face, but it was slim pickings. There was a sign saying thank you for panic buying from us. Oh. Saw Irene Clack approaching with her shopping trolley, so I quickly bought two tins of pork luncheon meat, a packet of boat laces, some glacier cherries and a copy of the Modern Angler magazine. Celery and tinned pork omelette for tea. Thursday. Went for a romantic and relaxing walk with my husband Fred up by the skateboard park. Saw Mrs Coyle and Mrs Clack meet at the youth hostel car park. They got out of their cars and set off for a walk together. They were not two metres apart. 
Later, Fred informed the, on them to the local police hotline using a funny voice. He said it was Welsh, but it sounded more Cumbrian to me. Celery soup for tea. Friday. Decided not to go outside today. It's not relaxing. Fred has attached a gardening glove to the end of a two metre long pole and is using it to wave at neighbours to make sure that they're keeping their two metre distance. He looks like an institutionalised lion tamer, sans lion. Suddenly remembered it was Good Friday and thought of popping down to St Barnabas's, but of course it's closed, and the vicar's locked himself in the rectory with all the Harvest Festival tins and that ceremonial spear from his missionary days. Fred made three Good Friday jokes. Celery salad for tea, Saturday. Fred has decided to carry on learning the ukulele. He's working on a riff by a band called Guns N' Roses. It consists of four notes and requires copious continual practice, apparently. Braised celery obliterated with jerky jerk chicken sauce for tea. Sunday, Easter today. Made some eggs out of gelatine, celery and the glacier cherries. I'm not a big fan of Easter anyway. It always catches me unawares. I don't know about you. I keep missing the moment when the second moon comes up after the spring equinox, after breaching the gap between Pluto and Venus rising, or whenever it is. Monday. Bank holiday Monday, though, I suppose. Every day is bank holiday Monday these days, except with no one driving up to the coast and sitting in their cars eating boiled eggs. I wish we had some eggs. Fred rebelled, rebelled rather, at being given celery bourguignon for dinner. Now I'm going to end this little broadcast of mine with a light-hearted section. It's a preview from our Wife on Earth uh, podcast series two that's going to be coming out soon with Cosmic Shambles Network. We're very proud about that. <clears throat> One thing that happens when you spend a good deal of time together in close proximity is that your partner's little idiosyncrasies, those quirks which at first seem so charming, so sweet, so adorable, like putting the DVDs back in the boxes upside down or drawing a Mexican in a boat when viewed from above on the scullery window every time the central heating's on, begins to grate a little. So after extensive research, i.e. asking the ladies of the WI WhatsApp group what they thought, I can now reveal the top three annoying habits which you once found endearing. A number three, a non-mover with washing up everything except the cutlery. Why does he do it, ladies and gentlemen? Does he think that the knives and forks need washing? Or does he think they'll magically clean themselves? I suppose we'll never know. This week's newest high entry at number two is losing the TV remote and then saying we need a remote to find the remote. Ha ha. Straight at number one is putting his socks on before his pants. No one wants to see that, ladies and gentlemen. Not even scientists. Thank you. All right, I better go now. Uh, Fred has uh, been put in a bad mood by knowing that I'm doing this here in this room and he wants to come back in and start up on Guns and Roses again, so I better go now. Best wishes to you all. Thank you for listening to my little broadcast. Goodbye. Mm. Hello, welcome back to uh, the uh, Shambles Stay at Home Festival. That was Celia, who of course uh, is also Joanna Neary. I mean, she's mainly Joanna Neary. Celia is just a, a, a wonderful uh, part that she plays. And uh, Joanna's got a, a second series of Wife on Earth, which is up on CosmicShambles.com, coming up very, very soon. You can listen to the old one. And also all of our book shambles and loads of interviews with scientists and lots of other things. I will briefly Hi. mention, uh, oh yeah, Josie. Dean Burnett's got a really great Log. book. Oh yeah, Dean, but Dean Burnett uh, did a really. We were talking about the five G thing. Did a very good uh, piece all about the the whole kind of five G. Uh, and and what's lovely, of course, is all the reactions he got from people, which are the normal kind of when conspiracy theory. theory. <laughs> Do the maths. Don't you understand how oxygen we are all of these kind of, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it's not, not really worth dealing with. Um, and also just remind you, we have a tip jar at the bottom of this. Uh, we're collecting money for some of the uh, performers, singers, all, all manner of people who uh, have basically had all their uh, work cancelled. And also for some of the venues, some of the smaller art centres, places like the Rondo and stuff like that, uh, trying to get a fund for them because of course a lot of them are struggling. And some of them will like the Bromsgrove uh, art tricks uh, possibly have to um, close down. And we want to keep them going for when this is all over and done with. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can also support the other stuff that Josie and me do and lots of other friends of ours, uh, Dean Burnett and Lucy Green, uh, with our Patreon as well. And that is all of that 
done which is well, much quicker than so many podcasts i'd listened to i did this when i was on i was with um laura uh who used to be she makes war but now is and um, and we were, we were on, on tour and we went let's listen to this podcast 15 minutes to someone going and if you can t- also my book is out very soon i need you to get and so mark many maron is talking about no mark, mark maron's one which you know i i, I love this some of his stuff but the 15 minutes of him going and i can't believe it david letterman is you know he's here you know david letterman is no no it's fine we believe it you've seen the listing he's gonna be here oh is this a pretend one is it is it it's not really david letterman and you just do all the voices i'm listening to a very hammy true crime uh, podcast at the moment because every other day i do a walk not a run and i listen to a podcast and um they they're sponsored by a phone game called best fiends and the woman who has to do the adverts is obviously quite a serious radio journalist and every single episode she has to go when i'm playing best fiends it's the most wonderful break for my brain and i'm like i know you don't mean this journalist. That's really, but that's the thing about podcasts which podcasts. i do uh, called stalking time for the moon boys with a mate of mine which is about david bowie it's very niche uh, and as a result of being very niche it doesn't We've never been sponsored properly. So with a not with a not very successful podcast, they just interrupt the podcast with adverts, right? But with a more successful one, like the one you're talking about, the host has, has to do to what pretend. they call in podcast advertising. Which means in the middle of a true crime thing about murder or whatever, yeah. they have to say, anyway, have you ever thought about what kind of mattress you really want? Yeah. <laughs> but, or <laughs> any <laughs> any of those energy or, or building or, or building up things going, this delicious mix of crushed sheep bone and cocoa powder. That <laughs> makes me but just because you mixed this and I suddenly realized it was down here. You might like the, I know you've probably got this book, this David Bowie book. Um but I've I bought loads it, of them. But I this, this got that one. Moon Age Daydream by Dave Thompson, who's written lots of stuff. But this is one of those ones that I bought in a second-hand shop because, amongst other things, it has a letter from Dave Thompson, and it's to Lawrence, I don't know who, enclosed, as promised, a copy of my David Bowie book. Thank you for your help during my research, but apologies in advance the state of the finished thing. The publishers and I did not see eye to eye over the relevance of much of what I wrote, so they chopped it all out at the last minute and replaced it with stories lifted by the editor from Peter Gilmore's book, etc. So <laughs> I can only say I hope you enjoy it more than I did. And I just love the fact that the, the author's fury is inside that book as well. That That's wouldn't be crazy. Dave Thompson, who was also I Igor Thompson. No, it's not. It's not uh, Dave Thompson who uh, and and who was uh, in, in the Yeah. yeah. Um, now I wanted to ask you this about um, when I uh, years and years ago I, I did an interview with you and I came around to your house and I looked at the bookshelves. I always do. One of those people. And I said to you, I said, David, it's really weird. I said you don't seem to have any a lot of history books. I said you have no science. I was quite surprised. And you said. Oh, I, th- I find science a bit boring. Mm. Now, since then, that yeah. has changed enormously. I mean, you did the play God's Dice, which is yeah. kind of about physics and also yeah. the idea of, of God. Wh- where was this this change? Because you've, you've hugely changed on on, on that. Uh, yeah, I think it's to do with my dad. Uh, my dad was a scientist. Uh, he's still with us, my father. Uh, some people who follow my career might know that my dad has uh, quite advanced dementia. He has a type of dementia called Pick's disease, which uh, it, certainly not so much now, but certainly at the start involved him shit swearing and shouting an awful lot, which made it quite difficult to know whether or not he had a disease because my dad always used to shout and swear an awful lot. Uh, but that aside, he was, during his early part of his career, he's actually made redundant when he was 42 and then had uh, just uh, sold dinky toys for the rest of his life. But before that, he was a chemist, not a pharmacist, but uh, he worked for Unilever and he had done biochemistry, he'd done a PhD in biochemistry and science was everything in our house. We he used to do this thing, me and my brothers, I've got two brothers, uh, of, uh, we had flashcards from the periodic table. So every Ooh. element would be on each card and it would have like the atom with the electrons and the symbol and various types of radioactivity or whatever. And we had to remember them. And he would <laughs> hold up and he would say, boron or whatever, tell us about it. And uh, it was like quite grim in some ways. And then when I decided when I was 16, I wasn't going to do science. I was going to do art subjects and I was going to, for my A-levels, English history. And I think I did economics as a kind of sop to the science part of him. I went and told my dad this, and I was really quite frightened of doing it. He was quite a frightening man, my dad. And he said, it's a waste of a brain, which is not good parenting. Let's be honest. It's not good parenting. And in some ways, ironic that he's the one now with dementia, I've always thought. But nonetheless, I think that there's been a return of the repressed, as it were, that as I got older, 
the part of him that was implanted in me that says science is incredibly important, science is the truth, has stuck with me. And I don't know if you think this or you think this, Josie, but there's always a part of me. I think even when I decided to do that, and even throughout my life that I've written books and done comedy and all the rest of it, a tiny part of me has always thought, well, real cerebral work, real mm. cleverness obviously resides in the sciences. How you see... My I, was, my I was very much brought up with my mum telling me that I had to be as useless to society as possible. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, there was absolutely no scientists in my family. So I, it wasn't the same. But that, that is very interesting. The idea of like what, because of what your parents have been like on a deep rooted level, mm. you consider to be legitimately intellectual. Yeah. And also the fact that everyone's going to have a different conception of that, that even they're not fully examining they're just kind of like taking that as red and then barreling on with their lives. Yeah. yeah. See, I find it the, the problem I've, I've found since I kind of, you know, on the, on the outskirts of that world, making a lot of shows, you know, with scientists and stuff, is that I find that the uh, it's a bit like, you know, when people to, in Australia talk about the fact that, oh, Melbourne and Sydney hate each other. Melbourne and Sydney hate each other. And then people in Sydney say, we're, we're fine with it. It's just Melbourne seemed to have a little bit of an, you know, you know yeah. that bit where, and I find that sometimes when I first went into that world with, with the arts, scientists love to go to concerts and all that, whereas the arts, I think because we go, I don't know this, and you're not allowed just to form an opinion on quantum electrodynamics, and say well my opinions is good there's a real there certainly has been a lot of antagonism to what and, and it goes throughout history you know london was the place of art manchester was the place of grubby technology and and, and science and it's it's interesting now because i think it is beginning to come together and that kind of aggression towards having to accept that someone if you are in a, you know any of us might go well i feel that my opinion on wits and weddings is as good as yeah. josie longzo but we can't say that when we're talking about no, you know point cosmology yeah um, there's no problem I mean, having gone to university and done english but at the end of the day it doesn't make any difference if i happen to think that i know what the wits of weddings means it doesn't that's not true whereas brian cox is correct in thinking that he knows about black holes or whatever but there is i think another reason which is to do with mortality i think which as you know about me uh, i am a fundamentalist atheist um, even though I, I'm very Jewish, uh, that is all ethnicity, ethnicity and culture or whatever. And I, I think of myself as um, a more extreme atheist. I'll, I'll do an arm wrestle with anyone who says they are more atheist than me. Uh, but And I think as you grow older, you kind of think, oh, fuck, I'm going to die soon. I'd quite like to know what it's all about. And you can't find out what it's all about, really, from obviously from religion if you're an atheist or indeed really entirely i think from arts and then what you think is physics i think because physics particularly and this is what god's dice was some sense about because of its microscopic sense of reality that underneath everything this is how things are that feels like there must be the truth unfortunately what you then discover when you do read about it is that that truth is incredibly uncertain mm. and unknowable and that's that's I found that fascinating when that became clear to me that all this time I've been thinking science is the way forward to the truth. And then the truth is hazy and ambiguous in science. I thought that was incredibly interesting. I think that's it's interesting. Um, your uh, um, friend and, and kind of former, uh, say, double actor, yeah, but but Frank, yeah, but but Frank Skinner. I remember bumping into Frank a few years ago in in Hay at the festival. Frank and he was science. Yeah, but he was going to see uh, Martin Rees, you know, the the uh, astrologer role. He was going to see all, and he see, he got a real fascination with it. But then. As far as I could see, the next time I saw him, he'd just gone, oh, no, now I'm just doing science fiction. I've gone back to reading science fiction. Oh, we love science because, fiction, yeah. Because it didn't offer, I think, during that week or however long he was in Hay and, and however long he spent with it, you're right, it doesn't give you an, an answer, but it gives you, I think, a far more interesting sense of what is going on, which I find quite... I've been interviewing a lot of scientists about this in the last couple of weeks, actually. And that bit of once you start thinking about the cosmic microwave background radiation and you think about all those tiny fluctuations end up becoming whole galaxies and they become you and they become me and they become the rings of Saturn, they become Jupiter and black holes and supernova. I actually find that strangely satisfying, even that it doesn't give me an afterlife, it doesn't give me anything, but to be part of a narrative which starts off in such a strange 
and and you know in some ways you could say uncanny way yeah. there was nothing but nothing with a lot of potential and you read Stephen Hawking and all of those years of philosophers going why is there something rather than nothing and Stephen Hawking goes oh it doesn't refute the laws of physics that's why yeah. brilliant <laughs> that's that done then let's move on, let's move on. and, and I, I can find that fulfilling but I think one of the things that's sorry to bang on about this but this is is I think a lot of people, you you glance past science, and if you just hear the bit, we're in a humdrum galaxy and a humdrum planet, or blah, 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 then you just go, oh, oh, man, that's really knocked the wind out of my sails. That's The existential anxiety is peaking again now. But if you keep, you have to keep reading it. Do you know what I mean? You have to have more than a passing relationship with it for in any way to start well, you, you, become a fulfilling narrative. I, I did actually really want you to come. I, I know you couldn't make it because you were touring, but I really wanted you to come and see my play because really it's about the intersection of the miraculous between science and religion. So it begins with Alan Davis played the main part of the physicist. Uh, he's approached by a woman, uh, a first year student, who declares that she's a Christian and he doesn't really take her seriously. And then she describes quantum entanglement, which for any, well, it's gonna to take too long to explain, but let, she describes quantum entanglement, which is the most extraordinary thing about how particles seem to be able to transmit information across 200 light years instantaneously, and it just seems impossible. And anyway, she talks about it for a bit, and he talks about it for a bit, and then he says, is that your question? And she says, no, my question is, if I am to believe that, I may as well believe in God, mightn't I? And it goes on from there to be about how she thinks there's a way of using physics to prove the existence of the miraculous. But that's partly because the miraculous is there in physics in this re really weird way. I, this is, I mean, this is definitely, this is definitely low lowering the tone, but I shared <laughs> a dressing room with, I was in the venue with your play. I was after your play when I was doing right. my show. So I shared a dressing room with all the actors and heard the play about 10 times. <laughs> it was great. And the oh, actors, I loved the actors so much. They were such lovely people. I was, um, yeah. So I feel really connected to the play oh, cool. in an odd way, just from oh, having sort of I mean, they were, sat they with were the actors every day. Brilliant, Joseph. They were a fabulous cast. You said I'm going to lower the tone. I thought you were going to tell a knob gag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I just, it's not very intellectual to be like, and let me tell you, they were <laughs> lovely. <laughs> they, were really, they were a fabulous cast, brilliant cast. And uh, yeah. A, a, a woman called Leela Mimma, a brilliant young actress, played that part, and she was so fantastic. But everyone, everyone was really—we were really lucky to get a cast. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that, that was it. That was uh, that, uh, to answer the question about two hours ago. Uh, I think it's just like I became fascinated by science in, in a way that involves not really understanding it, of course, because one of the things about tro properly understanding this shit is you have to be good at maths, and I'm yeah. just terrible at maths. So what you have to do is read these books that sort of say, well, don't really look at the equations. Here's an analogy involving clocks or ripples or ponds. And you understand them, but you will never really understand it without the maths. But the thing with maths is I did an A-level as, a a as a hobby in maths as an adult. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't do wonderfully well because I could, could not put the hours in. Oh. I'm, also, I'm too slow in exams. But it's one of those things similarly to what you were saying, which is, you read, you know, to a certain extent, and then just it starts getting interesting once at the point that most people go, oh, I can't be doing with this or, mm. oh, this is too much. Oh. And if you just push that tiny bit more, suddenly, like I remember realising uh, Pythagoras's theorem with like, uh, and then suddenly them going, Pythagoras's theorem works with extra dimensions. So it's not just like X, Y, and Z. It's like X, Y, Z, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it was suddenly like, wow these things are taking flight and yeah. flying off now and yeah. like so I think that like actually I'm a big believer that maths is a language to learn yeah. and it's a thing that anyone can do and that anyone can do to higher levels than most people get to uh, yeah. because I think if I can do it I was never really mathematically minded at all I was only ever into like so art. when did you do the A level as a hobby when did you do that I did it about ooh, five years ago, maybe a bit oh. less. Um, I went to Hackney Community College. It was brilliant. I got to hang out with loads of like fun teenagers, and yeah. I, I get to, I got to go to college sort of twice. But a week. you passed, so you, you passed. You got the qualification. Yeah, I passed by the school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I went to grammar school, and I did not pass by grammar school standards, but I did pass. Yeah, right. and I, I am. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I would recommend it to anyone. Obviously, the difficulty is that um, further education has been really, really messed up. 
but messed with, I suppose I should say. Um, but it, I would, uh, when you say you aren't good at maths, I, it's, you can be, <laughs> like right. everyone can be. It's a thing to learn and, and to practice like anything else. If you, re I think that's inter really interesting because if you read, I read loads of these books now, uh, you know, Carlo Ravelli's books, obviously Brian's books, but loads of them. I've even tried to read some of Stephen Hawking's books. And what I find is that a bit like you're saying, you think, I, uh, I don't understand this, I don't understand this. And then the door opens very briefly of understanding. And then you feel like, I've got it. But for me, it tends to slip away again. I think it does for most people. I think, but I think that's part of the, you have to accept that as being joyous. Those little moments, those little moments where, I mean, it's taken me a year and still, I mean, I've got so much, the next show that I'm doing with Brian, like sometime next year, you know, I'm doing so much reading for that. And every now and again, you get that bit where you go, you, a real genuine excitement. And it is like a peak experience, peak consciousness, where you mm. get that glimmer of understanding. Yeah. And then sometimes after a while, that understanding stays with you and you are able to understand it in your head. But you haven't yet reached the stage where you're able to convey that information. You know, there's about there's so many different stages. Then sometimes you go, oh, I'm able to convey this to other people now. You know, you know and each like, like when I said at the beginning, that bit of Ed Miliband talking to him about black holes holes it was the first time that i'd kind of gone oh no I, I do now have a better level of understanding than i had six months ago and a much better level of understanding than the six months before that like you said i'll never truly understand or really you know the mathematics you know with so many different ideas of quantum electrodynamics and all of those things oh yeah sorry i do appreciate that there is some extremely complicated <laughs> mathematics that is beyond all of us i do understand that but i do feel that like yeah maths gets unfairly um shut off for people when actually it's a brilliant thing that everyone can get more involved with i think you're right it's like learning a language which isn't something else like that or things like <laughs> that but i think you're right i think if you probably did it properly you you could do it um it's yeah, good sorry, teachers what? as well like if you encounter good teachers you suddenly you know the same with everything isn't it you you encounter good teachers and you're like ah yes i think uh, i think that part of the problem are we not going down a rabbit hole though now particularly like i can see robin and i'm thinking that i would i me and robin would quite like to talk about quantum entanglement now for about an hour and a half what's great is we're running out of time so you guys great can do that <laughs> oh no i've checked and we're not yet carlo we're not carlo ravelli's order of time i'm not yeah. sure we are running out of time that by the way is a really great book by the way, and, and it's such a, i highly recommend if you're thinking of start carlo ravelli uh he, he's written uh, like his book which is when you find out there's only one equation in physics which even requires time to be mentioned that to me is an incredible thing that all of the other equate everything else we understand about the universe time is not even taken into account so anyway we've got this hour and a half now and um but you're right we have pretty much run out of time uh josie there was um uh, we should mention david's tour of trolls uh you'll be able to see in uh 2043 uh, <laughs> when it's rolled over again and again and again and again keep rolling over in some yeah. parallel universe that carlo can describe for you uh but i believe details are on my website and i am still doing stuff i'm writing a kid's book and I'm writing a book about anti-Semitism and I'm still supposed to be writing a book about, uh, not a book, I'm supposed to be writing a comedy drama uh, about masculinity, but no one knows when either television proper or masculinity are going to start again. Right. So, <laughs> oh my God. Speaking of masculinity, I urge everyone to watch Five Guys, Five a, week Guys a Week on Channel 4. It is, all it's about is about the fact that these groups of men can't handle the fact that the woman has higher status in it it's astonishing you What's have to watch channel What's four five no. guys a week it okay. is an absolute experiment <laughs> okay I'll is it a documentary it it's a documentary no it's a silly dating show <laughs> oh okay oh, it's a dating show yeah it's it's a dating show where one woman lets five men stay in her house for a week and eliminates one a day and the men in it find it very difficult to handle i'm not saying that i wouldn't also find that difficult to handle i would but it is fascinating in terms of masculinity and how that works i think have they thought about doing a musical version where all the guys are called mo yeah. <laughs> i i want if they can combine that with 24 hours in a and e if it's a dating game <laughs> in the way because i love that show so much but you know that um thank you so much david and your children's books are great my, my son absolutely absolutely love them so good and josie what you're up to the rest of today um, I'm, I'm going, going to, to, for the next, for the next couple, couple of hours, hours play, play chess, 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 chess and, and do some yoga. <laughs> and then, and then later, later on tonight, tonight I'm doing a gig as part of Excess Malarkey, which is being streamed live online. So oh, that's great. really good people as well on the bill, so. 
Yeah, I did that last week. It is a lot of fun, and it's a great club up in Manchester, and it's really worth supporting them as well. It's one one of the best places. Brilliant. We're going to go over to uh, Phil Jays now. So, so keep up date with David. If you can, we just quick check actually. David, are you still able to? Is is your um, uh, documentary still uh, still uh, online? uh, Online. I think it went off. I think it went off. I think it extended. It It was on for a month. It was on for a month on iPlayer, and then they extended it. And now it is not anymore. So yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. That's it. Oh well, I'd really if it, next time it's up, everyone watch that documentary. Yeah. It's great and it was great. Know, and, uh, yeah, really, really good. Um, thank you very much, David Badil. Uh, thank and you, now we... thank you, Josie Long. Thanks for coming. And now Philip Jay's down in his uh, lovely, it's in his studio space there, which look look like you you're a toaster. I like it. <laughs> um, Phil, do you want to tell us a bit about? As we mentioned already, Phil is uh, I've talked with Phil many times, a uh, brilliant singer songwriter. And uh, do you want to tell us anything about the first song? The first song? Oh, you just doing one? <laughs> Whatever. Um, I wanted to talk to you about um, Dave Thompson. Oh, yeah. So I know Dave Thompson. Uh, he, he lives in America. Now, the, the rock critic. Is, was that a letter from Dave Thompson? In, it was a the... letter from Dave Thompson uh, about his Moon Age Daydream. Moon, Moon Age David Daydream. Bowie, uh, David Bowie uh, book. I'm not sure who the Lawrence was, whether it might have been Lawrence from Felt, the, the band Felt or not. Uh, but, yeah, tell me. Brilliant. Well, I, I'll, 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 <clears throat> I can send a link to this, can't I? I'll send him a link and get him to watch it and see uh, if he can shed any light on it. Yeah, it's very it's it's a lovely thing to see an author saying this isn't what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. this this was my battle. <laughs> anyway, so which uh, so you're t- singing all your songs in a well at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, Have you been yeah. finding it easy living in a well during this period of isolation? Well, you see, it, I, life hasn't changed very much for me because yeah, this is what I do every day anyway. I just come and sit in here. <laughs> um, I don't go out. So yeah, I'm. <clears throat> I appreciate. I'm very very lucky. I'm in a very very fortunate position. Because my life just hasn't really changed. Well, apart from the fact which uh, that I've um, not seen my girlfriend, which is a bit annoying. But other than that, oh, that's hard. It is, but um, well, it's it's an odd thing because I, I I don't know. But living in the same town, living in the same town, we've had this, of course, doing this show, which is sometimes four people have been on, all of whom live within a mile of each other, and this is the, um, there's no way that you can connect apart from you know it's occasionally wave across a park wearing your mask or whatever. Yeah, that's what we do. Wave through glass every now and then. Oh, <laughs> it's very romantic. It's all right. He, it, 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 he, he met is. her when she was in prison, so nothing's <laughs> changed. It's all yeah. fine. Old times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, the, the, the song I'm going to do is actually, uh, um, I, I, as I said, I was going to try and pick something. I'm doing a new album. At the moment, so this is a, a song off the new album, which is about childhood and summer. Oh, lovely. Yeah, well, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> it's called uh, Nadine One Summer. Under the trees, down by the water, cool in the grass, in the height of the summer, a hint of a breeze. Trembled the pages of our magazines As we sat picking daisies, Nadine And everywhere blossoms and bicycles Danced in the sunlight of my French exchange summer Deep in the heart of July When you tried to teach me the French For I love you But I just learned the French For goodbye Nadine Remember Nadine When I was twelve and you were thirteen Your father played jazz at work in the basement 
your mother baked bread whilst out on the pavement your sister hung round with boys on their mopeds and I held your hand at table in secret Nadine and everywhere Blossoms and bicycles danced in the sunlight of my French exchange summer. Deep in the heart of July, when you tried to teach me the French, for I love you, but I just learned the French. For goodbye, Nadine. Remember, Nadine, when I was twelve and you were thirteen. Remember, Nadine. Oh, Nadine. Thank you very much, Philip oh, Jays. Much, Philip oh. Jays, and thank you. Um, what a privilege! Them. What a privilege to get to hear your voice. Jays.com is the place to go, by the way, for uh, all of Phil's work. There's a, an enormous back catalogue of albums, and uh, all of them are worth worth your time. And there's, there's a, it's the one you just to, before you go, Phil. Is, is the one in particular where you think that's a good place to start? Because I, I definitely do think, in terms of recording and stuff like that, an ability to get production. You know, the, the, there's a, a real they get better and better with with uh, with each um, return to the studio. I think that the, the, the album, actually, the album that people seem to like the best is, is actually the second album, Cupid is a Drunkard, which we actually did record as live in a studio. We did 12 songs in a day. Unheard of. <laughs> <laughs> we just went in, did it, got to the end of the song and said, you happy with that? And people went, well, it was OK. We thought, as long as it was OK, we move on to the next one. We don't have time to mess about. So we, just, we did 12 songs we did from, from midday until midnight pretty much solid um but i think the songs on that album are probably the most representative of what i do um but yeah then people some people prefer the ballads and some people prefer the funny songs and some people prefer the angry, angry. songs or the or the misery the nice thing is a lot of the funny songs are also angry and miserable as well. Yeah. You don't realise <laughs> until the third verse and <laughs> then the roll doll twist occurs. Yeah. Twist occurs. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. As I said, jays.com, G-A-Y-S dot com. Uh, is he's just French. A G, he's J, French. J, J, sorry, J E A Y. I don't know. I do a G J thing. I don't know what that what form of uh, of, of strange like says. Like. In French, it's the other way around. Yeah. Ah, uh, well, that be yeah. I've, I'm very, I'm, I'm bilingual, but only by, with one letter. It's, it's not a great way of communicating. <laughs> thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Joseph. Thank thanks, you, Bill. Robin. Thanks, Dave. Have Dave, a lovely Dave. day. And Joanna Neary. Tomorrow we're back with, uh, amongst others, Deborah Francis White, guilty feminist. Oh, Deborah Francis White will be with us tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. and catch up with our science Q and A's, Josie's Quarantine Comedy Club, and please play something in the TikTok. And bye bye. bye. bye.